As Brother Mike has said earlier, it is good to see each and every one out this morning, especially those visiting with us. We want you to know that we count you as our honored guest. And if you're here and not familiar with the Church of Christ and you have questions about what we do and how we conduct our worship service, we simply ask you, ask a question. Ask us a question as to why we do what we do and we will provide for you an answer, not of our opinion, but of God's word, which is where we find how to worship God in spirit and in truth. Brother John, thank you for your song selections this morning. They set the tone for a lesson today that affects all of us no matter what's going on in our life. I'll give you a little background to this lesson years ago at Horizons. We would break down a song that our young people would sing and I was tasked with the assignment to speak on this subject in 2011. I hope I've perfected the lesson a little more and made it a little more complete. But I think it is a lesson that no matter what trial or tribulation that we're going on in our life, that it is a lesson which will benefit each and every one of us as we think this morning about our God. And I'm going to turn this screen on where I turned it off the other night so I'll know what I'm going to talk about. I promise you I don't have it totally memorized. But as we think about my comforter, my all in all, and as Brother Jonah read for us in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, our help in a time of need. I want you this morning, first of all, to be thinking about where comfort can be found at. I realize comfort can be found in many, many places. First of all, I think that we find comfort from within our own physical family. No matter what the situation is, family is family. And we all need family. But secondly, I think about that we seek our comfort from our church family. In my times of difficulty, and I know I'm not alone, I've been through many, I know that it is my church family who has been there by my side. It is my church family who have offered words of encouragement. It is my church family who have countless times stated to me I'm praying for you. And I know that because of our comforter, I know because of our great all in all, that the church family is there, is here for a reason. And I think we see that it is here for us because we must lean one upon another. That was the wisdom of God in establishing the church. We find comfort with our co-workers. Or if you play on an athletic team, maybe it is you find comfort from those teammates. Or maybe it is other friends. But what I would like to do this morning is for us, first of all, to understand that the greatest source of comfort is the Almighty God whom we serve. And when I read, and as Jonah read for us, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, where the writer there says, let us come boldly. When he says to come boldly, what the writer is expressing to us is that we ought to have great confidence and that we ought to have great assurance that no matter what trial of life, no matter what storm of life that we face, that we can go before our God and that we can approach Him with great confidence and we can ask Him to help us in our time of need. And as a Christian, let's, let's understand 
Some people look at us as Christians and they say, well, you all don't ever need any help. You all don't need any comfort. You don't ever have times of need because you're a Christian. Oh, how wrong they are. I wonder if you and I as Christians, we don't need more comfort because of the trials we face and the struggles and the temptations that the world throws at us. I wonder if we don't need more comfort from one another and from God. But here in Hebrews chapter 4, there are three things that I find that tells me that I truly have a comforter and I truly have an all in all who cares for me. Let us begin thinking first of all about the Word. You and I have the sword, the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says the Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We know from Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 that there were times in which God spoke in other ways. But Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 says, But in these last days God has spoken through his Son. Some folks in our world today say, Well, the Bible is dead. The Bible is out of date. We need some new revelation. Brother Hebrews 4 and verse 12 convinces me and it tells me because of my faith in who God is that God's word is more alive and more powerful today when I will allow it to be. It is not something that needs updated. It is something that needs to be applied. You see, and his word is sharp. It causes us to search deep within ourselves to see that we are not alone, that we need help in our time of need. When you go back to Hebrews chapter 3, and the writer here, remember the book of Hebrews, is trying to impress upon the people's mind that the old law is out of date, that the old law is done away with. But there is this new law that has greater promises, that has greater comfort, that has greater things for us. And so when I go back to Hebrews chapter 3, there are things listed there that tell me why people fail in Christian living. First and foremost, they fail because of unbelief in God's Word. They're the ones who do not truly see the working of God through His Word. They do not understand how God has supplied for us every need we have. They miss the very simple fact they miss the fact, according to Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. <laughs> Brethren, the only way that we are going to see God in our time of need is if we go to the word in which he has given us. But then we move forward. And the second thought from Hebrews chapter 4 comes from verse 13. And that is we have his sight. In verse 13 it says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Let us remember something. God sees things differently than we see things. We go back to the passage there in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 17 where the sons of Jesse were being brought before the prophet. And the prophet remember as they were trying to select this new king to replace Saul, what was he looking at? He was looking at the outward part of men. He was looking to see the physical attributes of man. But none of Jesse's sons fit what God wanted. God said, look at him differently. Look for something different. Brethren, that's what God wants us as his children to be. We need to look at each other differently than just that which is on the outside. We need to look at each other for what is inside so that we might find comfort in one another. 
and that we can lean one upon another in our time of need. You see, God sees everything. He sees things that you and I may not realize. He sees what we have need of. You see, I hear many sometimes say, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I just don't know how I'm going to move forward. But remember, there is no night that is too dark in which the light of the Lord won't shine. There is no loneliness too solemn that God will not be your friend. And there is no sorrow too great that he will not help you overcome. I'm not going to take time to read Psalm 139, but take time to read and see what David says in that passage. And so you and I, as we think and as we know that our God is watching over us, we ought to see and that ought to show us and that should give us great comfort. But then thirdly this morning, and I think this may be out of all of them, and I know they're all important, and maybe I shouldn't try to prioritize, but we have his son. Brother John led for us just before our lesson. He knows just what I need. God knew that we needed a Savior. God knew that we needed someone to whom we could look to to find an example of how we could overcome our discomforts, our grief. He knew that we would need one who would show us how to be comforted. And brother, I don't know of a greater example in all of Scripture than the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who shows us that the Father cares. Or someone immediately might say, but Brother Ray, I think you've lost your focus. I think you've lost your, 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 your thinking process here. Did you not know that Jesus was the divine Son of God? Yes, I do. But I also know that that same divine Son of God came and He lived life and he faced the same struggles that you and I face today. Only that he would go through his life as one who would be with no spot, with no blemish, with no guile. Brother Freeman, beautiful passage from Isaiah 53 that sums that up today as we prepared our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper. To remember what Jesus did for us. But in Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse 14 and verse 15. The writer says, Seeing then we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For do we not have a high, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. As that high priest, he passed through the heavens. He can sympathize with you and I. He can offer us this great comfort because, brethren, he suffered persecution. He suffered through the grief of his friend, Lazarus. As he stood by the tomb, it says in the book of Luke, that Jesus wept. Or when he oversaw the city of Jerusalem in his last days. And it, he was mourned with what was going on. And he cried out, Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem. Jesus suffered grief as you and I experience grief. He was tempted, and we mentioned this in our Bible class this morning. He is tempted just as you and I are. Yet with every temptation he faced in Matthew 4 and Luke chapter 4, Jesus was, over, was able to overcome his temptation because he was able to say, It is written. 
And there's power in those three words. It is written. What Jesus was really saying is I'm going to turn to my God who gave us this word. I'm going to lean on him. It was God's word that helped Jesus overcome a great lesson for us to learn today. You see, he knew who our hope. He knew who the great comforter was. And he was not ashamed to call upon him. But let's think this morning of a few examples. And I'm just going to talk about a couple of these examples this morning. I'm not going to talk about all of them. But a couple of, of, of three of them are, my, are, are probably my favorites. When I think about Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, and that dear passage of the conversion of the Philippian jailer. Remember Paul and Silas, what were they arrested for? What were they put into the innermost prison for? And when you remember that they were put in there for sharing, teaching, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, our struggles and our trials pale in comparison. These men were put in the innermost part of that Philippian jail, a place where no man should ever want to go or ever have to be put. But there they were at about midnight in the midst of a very dark hour knowing that their very life could have been in jeopardy. But the Bible says at that midnight hour, they were singing and praising our God. Brethren, have you thought about the significance of what it means that they were praising our God? They were appealing to Him for their comfort. Oh, what a wonderful thought. Or perhaps we need to go back to Daniel. Or to another one of those great Old Testament passages where the king made a decree and Daniel said, I'm not going to obey your decree. And so the tattletales, what did they do? What did they do? They went to the king and said, hey, do you know that, old, and I'm paraphrasing, please indulge me. They went to the king and said, hey, do you know that your most trusted ally, your man who you're, who you're thinking about putting, trusting this kingdom in, do you realize that he's not doing what you said? That he's defying a direct order of the king? And the king had no choice but to cast him into the lion's den. But to cast him in the lion's den. There are days when maybe we feel like maybe we feel like we're in the lion's den. But who was there for him? Who was there to give him his comfort? Was it not God? And even the king declared, I knew. I knew your God would take care of you. Or how about the three friends of his? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three young men wouldn't bend. They weren't going to bow down to the decree of the king. They wouldn't bow down to the king. And because of that, the Bible says they wouldn't burn. When you go back to Daniel chapter 3, you will see that the king was so upset that it says he heated that fiery furnace up ten times hotter than he had intended it to be. But when those folks that day looked into that fiery furnace, oh, by the way, some days, guess where we feel like we're at? We feel like we're in that fiery furnace, don't we? We feel like that the heat is on us so hard, what am I going to do? Let's respond like those three. I don't care if you throw me in that fiery furnace. Our God, he will take care of us. And so after they cast them into the fiery furnace, they peered into it. Anybody remember what those who peered into that fiery furnace saw? They didn't just see three men. What did they see? They saw four. 
Who did they see? They saw God. They saw God in that fiery furnace giving comfort to those three young men. Guess what? The same God that comforted Paul and Silas and Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego is the same God who will comfort us today in all of our time of need. Jeremiah, go back and read in Lamentations about Jeremiah. But what did these three, what was it that these saw how was it that they were able to overcome? You see, all three of them and others in Scripture, they understood because of their faith in God and who He is and who He was for them, they saw the one who was the comforter. They understood who the all in all was. Brethren, you and I today, we can have that same understanding. How can we have that same understanding? We can have it. As we look at the last example today, when I turn and I think about Peter, I think about Peter in Matthew chapter 14, beginning there in verse 22, down through verse 33. And the Bible says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he set the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. And when the evening had come, he was there alone. But the boat by now was in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and called him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the winds ceased. Today, we're like Peter. We're like Peter. We're like the others. Who we see Jesus. But yet we don't want to say that it is Him. Brethren, we need to see Jesus for who He is and for what He has done for us. We need to see Jesus as the one who will allow us to walk on the water in the time of a troubled sea. We need to see Jesus as the one who when our faith is weakened, when we turn away in doubt, and trust me, the trials and the tribulations that we are going through in life, they're there because Satan wants us to doubt in the God of heaven. But we can be as Peter. When we begin to sink, we can cry to the Lord, Help me! These past several days, I would not be able to be where I am today. I would not have made it through this sermon this morning if it was not because I cried out to my God, Help me! He has helped me. Oh, but wait, I'm not done. He has helped me because I asked you to pray for me. 
And I ask you to have Him surround me. We will get through our trials and our tribulations. Because the same hand that reached out to save Peter is the same hand that will reach out and save you. This morning, what a blessing it's been to be with everyone. What a joy it's been for me to be able to look at this lesson and to draw great strength and great comfort from it. I hope it's been that for you. Perhaps we have one here who doesn't know what it means to experience the comfort of God. Perhaps you need to know that there is a God. He is real. And He wants you to be saved. And He shows that love to you in the fact that He sent His only begotten Son to give His life for you. This morning, will you begin the journey of a Christian life through the faith that you have developed in His Word, knowing that He is our all in all. Will you repent and leave the way of sin, the way of the world? Will you turn to Him and place all your confidence in Him? Will you confess the name of Jesus as the Son of the living God who gave His life for you? And you can be immersed in the water of baptism this very hour. You will have your sins washed away. You will rise to walk in newness of life. And God will add you to His church. Amen. Or maybe you've done that this morning. Maybe your struggle is great. Maybe you've allowed your struggle to turn you away. Brother John came Wednesday night asking that he might give his life and rededicate it back to God. Do we have others who need to do the same? Again, repent, leave the way of sin, confess your sins before the assembly this morning and before the God of heaven. Will you let us pray with you? Will you let us pray for you? There's not one of us here that's going to get to heaven alone. We must have each other. Whatever your need might be, our prayer is to come and always stand.